Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classical Christian Thought. <clears throat> this is episode one, or actually, rather, uh, lecture one of the course on my book, Melchizedek and the Last Supper. Um, for those of you who have, are not aware, um, I have uh, a book that I wrote. It came out, uh, I published it in uh, either 2021 or 2022. Uh, January of 2022, uh, took me all of 2021 to write it, and um, the subtitle is Biblical and Patristic Evidence for the Sacrifice of the Mass, and <clears throat> this book was particularly uh, important to me um, because it basically gives an apologetic for why uh, serious Protestants who are eager to follow God's word um, should be Catholic or Orthodox, basically. <laughs> um, so the study, the material of the book, the content of the book, really uh, explains some of the revelations that came to me. And when I say revelations, I don't mean private revelation. I just mean the 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 illumination that God gave me uh, back around 2012 2013 uh, that the Bible clearly teaches the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is a doctrine that Catholics and Orthodox hold to, and uh, it's what's what's significant about this is that almost no uh, Protestant community. Um, holds the view of transubstantiation. There are some insignificant exceptions to that, most notably the Anglo-Catholic tradition, which in many cases holds to the doctrine of transubstantiation and some minor variations from the Catholic view of that. <clears throat> but I don't think it's a very significant um uh, fact because uh for reasons i'll mention once we get into the course of course but uh this doctrine of transubstantiation has powerful dividing value and what i mean by that is if the doctrine of transubstantiation is true then that eliminates almost every just about every Protestant alternative as the truth, because almost all of them, pretty much all of them, reject this doctrine as heretical. Now, they may not condemn Catholics for holding to this doctrine. That seems to be more prevalent, especially in our modern day, in the ecumenical era. But uh, serious and classical Reformed Protestants still see this as a very serious error on the part of Catholics and Orthodox. And so if it is true that the Bible teaches the doctrine of transubstantiation, well, that would mean that the Reformed, the Reformed communities, the uh, and the Lutheran communities, so worldwide Lutheranism, you know, every conservative confessional Lutheran community under the umbrella of Lutheranism, uh, regularized Anglicanism, the Church of England for the last five centuries, Presbyterianism, Episcopalianism, <clears throat> um, Evangelicalism, of course, the Baptist movement, uh, they're, they're all, they would all be opponents to our Lord if the doctrine of transubstantiation is true. I have many of those, many of you who know my personal testimony uh, know that I came from uh, reformed uh, churches that took this matter very seriously and even would anathematize Catholics and Orthodox for holding to this doctrine. They would, they would cite uh, St. Paul in the beginning of Galatians uh, that the anathema that Paul puts on all who, who come with a different gospel 
are to be under eternal curse, the eternal curse of God, which is what anathema meant in Paul's day. Um, and so when I learned that I was actually anathematizing uh, Christ and his doctrine, uh, I realized that um, not only um, is uh, not only is the Reformed community seriously in error over this matter, but it it expanded the credibility of Catholicism and Orthodoxy in my mind. And so it, it, this particular subject has tremendous dividing value because it divides those who are right and those who are wrong very clearly. There's a line in the sand to be made here. The Protestant movement, the reforms of the 16th century, which by and large, almost 99.9% .9 of it rejects transubstantiation. On the other side of that line is the historic churches, which call themselves apostolic churches, Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the um, Oriental Orthodox churches. <clears throat> I won't list the name of them, but they're not all in communion with each other. Uh, I have a footnote at the beginning of the book, which I recommend everyone purchase uh, as we go through this course, which which uh, details some of the Oriental Orthodox churches. And I also give a list of those Anglo-Catholic and even non-Catholic apostolic alternatives that exist in very small number in the world that would accept transubstantiation. But again, uh, they're not significant uh, in this discussion, uh, as I'll explain as we get further into the course. So th this book is kind of like the papacy. If the papacy is true, that has tremendous uh, dividing power because it, it basically um, brings Catholicism as the true religion and all those who do not believe the papacy as uh, opposing the true religion, whatever that entails for their personal soul and relationship with God. That's not a question I'm in, in the position to decide. Um, but it would certainly mean that they are opposing objectively what the apostolic truth is if the papacy is true. So I hope I hope you as the listener understands the significance here. The papacy is obviously a much more clear matter. So if the papacy is true, then that means that Catholicism is true. That means that transubstantiation is certainly true, of course. Um, and so someone might say, well, why waste my time studying this particular doctrine? I might as well just study the papacy. Um, and there's some gravity towards to that point. However, some folks do study the history and uh, are not always convinced by the arguments of the papacy. And so maybe taking a break from that and looking at this particular doctrine um, would afford you um, some some value in, in pushing you at least to the point where you know you can't be a Protestant anymore, uh, do, do you see? So it's got tremendous dividing power in that it brings you to the dividing line where you know you can't be part of the 16th century reforms and all of their uh, legacies that exist today. All right, so let's get started here. Um, the first thing is, we'll look at the first uh, intro slide here. Melchizedek and the Last Supper, this is the introduction. Now, <clears throat> I want to read the back of the book, so that way you guys get a uh, brief synopsis of what the book's about. Um, if you don't ha own the book yet, um, like I said, I, I strongly recommend you, you, you buy this book, the Kindle and the... Uh, Hardback or paperback is available on Amazon. We'll talk about that towards the end. But in the back of the book, I give a, a brief summary. And so those of you who are watching or those of you who are just listening to the audio, um, this is what you'll be hearing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin reading now. Christians have always believed that the law of Moses and the prophets of Israel foretold the expiration of the Old Covenant and the coming of a new covenant that would restore the people of God under a new Davidic king who would rule the world from Jerusalem 
and serve as an everlasting priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus of Nazareth, proclaimed as Lord and Messiah, is firmly believed to be Israel's long-awaited king and priest, who, after offering his human body as a propitiatory sacrifice to God in violent death, rose again and ascended to God's right hand to minister in the heavenly sanctuary on behalf of the covenant people. The old covenant administration sustained a live priesthood according to the order of Aaron, but the new covenant priesthood under Jesus Christ was designed to be according to the order of Melchizedek, a mysterious figure whom Moses introduced in Genesis as a priest who presented bread and wine, blessed Abraham, and then received his tithe. What is the significance of Melchizedek's priestly service, accompanied by the elements of bread and wine, and Christ's Last Supper? This book will explore the scriptural and patristic witness for how Christ's Melchizedekian priesthood requires that his new covenant oblation includes the offering of bread and wine. Written for readers who are investigating the teachings of ancient Christianity, this book will explain the rich typology between Melchizedek and Jesus Christ, both kings of Salem, which means peace, and priests whose bread and wine serve as elements reflecting their priesthood. Hidden in this story are evidences for the belief in Eucharistic transubstantiation and the sacrifice of the Mass as held by the Church Fathers and Apostolic Churches for nearly 2,000 years. Close quote. So that's the back of the book. It's quite long, but um, that is what we're going to be looking at here. That's a summary uh, of what we're going to get into. Now, uh, those of you who are Catholics and who are listening, and those of you who are Protestants who are listening, you might be wondering, well, is this is this something that Eric alone has come up with? Uh, because it's quite often when you hear uh, the doctrine of the Eucharist and the Bible, uh, Catholics are typically going to John 6, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, um, trying to uh, erect arguments from the institution narrative at the Last Supper. Uh, it's not often, at least in my experience and in the experience of many people I know, that people go to Melchizedek and the Old Testament uh, imagery of this figure as a as an argument for the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist, transubstantiation in particular. So I think it's I think it would be good to begin by uh, showing how uh, I am not giving something that is uh, my own opinion, but has great pedigree from the history of the church um, and even the under the Roman Catholic magisterium, uh, which is uh, the most pertinent subject in this question. Um, now, I will say that throughout the course, I will be surveying church fathers, ecclesial statements, conciliar statements. So in this intro, I'm just going to be touching upon some of the more outstanding testimonies um, that bear the pedigree that I just said. Uh, so that way, the, the you know those of you who are peering in, just kind of checking out and seeing what's going on here, uh, can understand that this is not just some uh, opinion or some squirrely idea that Eric Ibarra uh, came up with. So the first uh, place we want to look at is the Council of Trent uh, in uh, the 13th session, which which opened up in 1551. It states in that session the following. He, Christ, therefore, our God and Lord, though he was by his death 
about to offer himself once upon the altar of the cross to God the Father, that he might there accomplish an eternal redemption. Nevertheless, that his priesthood might not come to an end with his death, at the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, that he might leave to his beloved spouse, the church, a visible sacrifice, such as the nature of man requires, whereby that bloody sacrifice, once to be accomplished on the cross, might be represented, the memory thereof remain even to the end of the world, and its salutary effects to the remission of those sins which we daily commit, declaring himself constituted a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, offered up to the Father his own body and blood under the form of bread and wine. Close quote. Now, we'll talk more about the Council of Trent and the meaning of this passage in uh, lecture number one. This is the introduction, so lecture one would be the next one. But it's a clear connection here. Uh, the order of Melchizedek, bread and wine, the offering of our Lord's body and blood. So it's very clear the Catholic Church has understood this connection. Now, the next statement I want to look at is from the Roman Catechism, which was released and published in 1566. The Council, it's otherwise known as the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Sometimes it's referred to as the uh, the Catechism of Pope Pius V. Um, during the sessions of the Council of Trent, the idea of uh, you know responding, you know, the, this era is the Counter Reformation. You know, some people don't know this, but you know there was the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Of course, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, uh, King Henry VIII several figures in the Anabaptist tradition, all of these figures represent this massive reform, Reformation. Um, well, the Catholic Church always knew that it needed to be reformed. Reforms had been called for centuries. Uh, all Going all the way back to the 11th century, there had been huge calls for uh, reform, uh, in particular to the spiritual status of the Church. But in the 16th century, the, the Catholic Church responded to the Reformation by also doing a counter-Reformation, not just to respond to the reform, the Protestant Reformers, but also to um, investigate its own troubling features uh, that the Protestants were rightly pointing out. Well, so you know, Luther was publishing tracts, Calvin was publishing tracts, writing decrees, writing uh, papers, uh, same with Zwingli and the rest of the the you know major speakers in the reform movement, and so the the, the Catholic Church understood that there would would need to be some sort of catechetical offset uh, published for the common people, for parish priests, for seminarians, uh, so that they could be well educated in the biblical foundations and the patristic foundations and the theological foundations for Catholicism over the claims of the reformers. And so uh, during the sessions of the Council of Trent, we see talk of this committee set up to formulate a catechism. That's why it's called the Catechism of the, Catholic, uh, the Council of Trent, not because Trent made the Catechism its own decree, but because it recognized the need as fulfilling the vision of the Council that there should be a committee underneath the papacy um, that would uh, oversee this project of making a Catechism for the whole Church. That ended up being the... Uh, the Roman Catechism or the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Uh, those who were involved in this project were uh, most notably St. Uh, Charles Borromeo. Uh, it took several years uh, with many good theologians uh, to produce and was finally released in uh, 1566 under the papacy or the pontificate of 
uh, Pope Pius V. And that's why sometimes it's called the Catechism of Pope Pius V. Well, this is uh, th this catechism has been it's 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 universal. It's basically embedded into the bloodstream of uh, the, of, of the Catholic faith <clears throat> for doctrine. Okay, Pope Leo the Thirteenth lauded it as a wonderful catechism for the whole Church. Uh, Pope Pius X lauded it as a universal catechism, and even Saint John Paul II took note of the stature of this catechism well let's get to what it says about our talk our, our topic here <clears throat> quote the mass according to this catechism was foretold before and after the promulgation of the law of moses by a variety of sacrifices but in none of these sacrifices in the old testament is the prefiguring more explicit than in that of Melchizedek, for the Savior declaring himself to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, at the Last Supper offered to God the Father his body and blood under the appearances of bread and wine. Close quote. <clears throat> My citation's there at the bottom. It's also quoted in the book, uh, basically on page one. So what we see here in the Roman Catechism is a clear connection between uh, the Melchizedekian bread and wine, uh, where Melchizedek is acting as a priest, and then Christ coming in the order for his own new covenant priesthood, in the order of Melchizedek, taking, taking bread and wine and offering it as his own body and blood, which is the only uh, sacrifice for the new covenant. So we see here clear connection being made in this catechism. So uh, what we need to understand, th th so those are two sources we're going to, we're going to visit more in, in, in some slides here coming. Uh, but let me explain a little bit about what needs to be understood when we read the Old Testament as Christians, because uh, those of you who are Protestants who are listening or who are Catholics who are listening and who are well versed in the Old Testament know that this, you know, Melchizedekian new covenant priest coming to offer his own body and blood under the, under the appearances of bread and wine. That's not all clearly spelled out. <laughs> OK, um, so we got to go back to um, an ancient methodology, which. Um, it began in part um, in, sh in, sh in the shadowy uh, illumination of the, the prophets. Like First Peter tells us that the prophets were, were trying to gaze at what, they, what it was that what they were writing about would be when it came. They didn't quite understand everything. Um, and yet when we, we start to, when we see the New Testament come, we see Christ come, uh, he's saying that what he's doing, his mission, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the formation of the church, all these things are simply a fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. But the Hebrew scriptures don't exactly spell that out uh, uh, very easily anyway. Uh, um, am I right? Um where in the Hebrew scriptures do you see the foretelling of, 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 of you know, put in plain language that Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary, the virgin, would be the be God in the flesh and would die on the cross for the sins of the world and would rise from the dead and bring the Holy Spirit to fulfill the covenant of Abraham and uh the Gentiles would come become part of the people of God. Those things, you know, if you're well versed in the Old Testament, you you're probably thinking immediately of verses in your mind. But it would it, it it's not a stretch to say that it's not clear. It's not something that jumps out in the way that like a witness testimony of a murder scene or a, an accident would sound like uh, in court, for example. Jesus often 
made it made it seem as though the Old Testament was that clear. Like in Luke twenty four, he, he says he, he he makes it seem as though it's the the hardness of it's basically the the, the pro, it's a problem of faith that people can could not see that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead in fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, the law and the prophets. Um, but Paul, who he himself was a, a Jewish genius, he was a scholar, he was a Pharisee, he was a man of the book, a man of the Hebrew scriptures. He understood this dynamic that I'm talking about because he uh, daily, weekly uh, argued with very intelligent Jews about how the events of Jesus as the Messiah who died and rose again is fulfilling the scriptures, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And so he understood something that we're about to read in his epistle to Rome, where what you see is that the Old Testament, yes, it foretells Jesus. Yes, Christ fulfills the Old Testament scriptures, but there's a certain decryption that has to be uh, provided, uh, for lack of a better term. I don't want to make it sound like God made things. He encrypted the message of salvation in the Old Testament. But it's close to that concept. It's close to that concept. Um, let's, let's read what St. Paul says here in Romans 16. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever close quote. This is Romans 16, verse 25 to 27. Now, pay attention to this text. I have it in red, bold, and, and it's italicized. He is, Paul is saying that this mystery, which is really the gospel, okay, the preaching of Jesus Christ is the gospel, is the mystery revealed here, right? Okay, so the gospel was kept secret since the world began. That seems pretty easy to follow, yes? Well, look at where he thinks that this secretized modality changed. He didn't say it was kept secret since the world began, but made known through Moses and the prophets. No. It's a, it, it's a mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest he's talking about the now of his time the coming of jesus the resurrection and the ascension and the pentecostal outpouring of the spirit so what that means so far is that when the law was produced by moses that's the first five books of the uh of the hebrew bible the pentateuch when the law was produced, this mystery, the gospel, was still kept secret. <clears throat> when Joshua continued writing, it was still kept secret. When the Chronicles came and First and Second Kings was written, the prophets were written, Psalms, Proverbs, Wisdom, all these writings, um, all the way up to the last... Um, prophet, you know, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, and and then most Bibli Old Testament biblical uh, table of contents ends with Malachi. Um, I prefer reading the Old Testament chronology. That's fine. But all these prophets, all the way up to the, you know, what's known as the intertestamental period before St. John the Baptist comes, that whole era, Paul is saying that it's a secretized epoch. The gospel was hidden 
throughout this entire time. That's what Paul is saying. Okay. So that means that whatever we know from Adam and Eve, from Noah, from Moses, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from Egypt, the, the Red Sea crossing, the, the, the Sinai covenant, uh, the, you know, the, the, the kings of Israel, uh, the covenant blessings and curses, the exilic penalty, the restoration through the prophets with a new David, with a new covenant, and all these things. That whatever could be known from that, it was still kept hidden. Something it was still secretized, um, and only unveiled, only revealed in the now of Saint Paul's ministry or the apostolic ministry. And then look at what he says. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. By the prophetic scriptures. So the very prophetic scriptures that were written, produced, studied, memorized by the people of Israel for centuries, while those prophetic scriptures still were secretizing this hidden mystery, the now of the apostolic era changes this altogether so that, that the same scriptures wherein this mystery was hidden, it's by those very scriptures which formerly hid what is now revealed that is doing the revealing of the gospel. This is amazing. One of my favorite topics in uh, biblical studies is, is understanding how the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, were veiling a certain mystery. We know that mystery is our Lord Jesus. And that the same scriptures now, once the events come, once the events that they were all pointing towards comes, now those very same scriptures now throw light on our eyes. It's just an amazing concept. Well, this is pertinent to this subject of Melchizedek. Because the figure of Melchizedek doesn't come up quite much in the Old Testament. He's in and out, Genesis 14. Comes up in a statement in Psalm 110. And yet he is vastly important in New Testament uh, theology, as those of you who have read the book of Hebrews know. All right. So we see that Paul has this understanding of the Hebrew scriptures as uh, hidden and then revealing once the events of redemption had come. Well, that's important to understand this next idea, which is typology. Typology. What is typology? This kind of sounds like a fancy English modern term, uh, another contemporary thing. No, it's not. This is <laughs> the, the term typos actually goes all the way back to uh, Romans 5 uh, when Paul wrote it. Um, and it was understood by the, the early patristic writers, early Christians, uh, going back to the beginning. But typology, we have to understand what this is, what this means. Okay, we have a good definition here by uh, a scripture scholar G.K. Beale in his handbook on the New Testament use of the Old Testament exegesis interpretation put out by Baker Academic. He writes, quote, the study of analogical correspondences among revealed truths about persons, events, institutions, and other things within the historical framework of God's special revelation, which, from a retrospective view, are of a prophetic nature and are escalated in meaning. Close quote. That's what typology or a type is. This is Beale giving us a very good definition. So typology means, uh, just to flesh this out, is certain persons, events, institutions, in the Old Testament that serve as an analogical prefiguring for a future event that will mirror it in many ways, but expand the meaning, okay? So the crossing of the Red Sea, for example. 
that's that's a type for Christian baptism. We leave the Egypt of our own lives. The slavery in Egypt symbolizes our slavery to sin. We cross the Red Sea and enter into a new covenant with Christ at the Last Supper. Well, that's like Israel coming out of the slavery of, the, of Egypt in the Old Testament, coming through the Red Sea, making covenant, and to, to enter into a relationship where God will be their God and he will be their, uh, God will be their God and, and they will be his pe people, the, the special covenant people. Okay, you've got that. You've got David, King David. He's a type of, of Christ. If you read some of his Psalms, he's, he's lamenting, he's speaking of victory, he's speaking of rejection. All these things are picked up in the New Testament as, as we see Christ himself quoting Davidic Psalms. As 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 if he's reliving them as 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 David's grandson, but a greater son than than he's greater than David himself. Um, you see this with Noah's flood; the world is destroyed, and a new beginning with a new humanity with Noah's family starts. Well, that's a type of baptism again, where you've got this new creation and a new beginning. All the sin has been washed away, and a fresh start has begun. Adam, when Adam sinned, he brought death upon the whole world. Well, when Christ obeyed God and died on the cross for the sins of the whole world, he brought blessing to the whole world. You see, you have the first and second Adam. First and second Eve, okay? Her father spoke about Eve, how her disobedience led to the curse of mankind, and then we speak of the second Eve, the, the, the new Eve, Mary, the Virgin Mary. Uh, her faith and obedience brings blessing and salvation to the whole world. Uh, Moses, you know, he's the prophet that brings a, the covenant re revelation. Well, there's a prophecy in, in Moses' writings about a new prophet who comes. That's Jesus who gives the law on the, Mount, uh, on, on the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks as one having authority. So we have the, these, you know, this this type typological figures. Well, Melchizedek is one of those, especially because Psalm one ten, which is extremely important in biblical and in, in Christian hermeneutic of the Old Testament, Melchizedek is said to be of the order of the coming everlasting Messiah, and so that. You could draw out, uh, 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 you can draw out a lot of significance from that, as we see from the author to the to the Hebrews in the New Testament. But Melchizedek's features, the bread and wine, his priesthood, um, the fact that uh, you know he is a high priest of God and blesses Abraham, all these things have rich significance that get fulfilled in Christ, who is coming in the order of Melchizedek brings out bread and wine in the very action or the enacting of his covenant sacrifice, inaugurating the new covenant, right? This is my body, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. This is what he said in the institution narratives and in the Gospels. So covenant language, priestly language, sacrificial language, bread and wine language, and in the order of Melchizedek is very clear. Melchizedek is, is a typological figure. All right, let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so let's read Psalm 110 real quick. Uh, psalm 110 uh, says the following. It's a it's a messianic psalm. So let me say that, uh, preface that. Uh, so what you're going to be reading here is understood uh, by, by Jews and Christians, really, as a, a statement about the, the Messiah's future uh, from David's standpoint. Quote, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, close quote. Psalm 110, verse 1 to 4. So that means that the future Messiah, 
is going to be Lord and is going to uh, reign, going to have a kingdom in Zion, obviously speaking of the Davidic dynasty. Um, and uh, he's going to be a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And by then, the, the only significance of Melchizedek is that he came out in Genesis, brought, brought out bread and wine, blessed Abraham, received the tithe from Abraham, he was king of Salem, and he was a righteous man, high priest of, of the God Most High. That's that's it. This is going back to that whole encryption idea um, where the events have to happen in order for the decryption to happen and, and, and for you to see the clarity. All right, let's move on. The next uh, Old Testament site, the quotation I want to give is, is Malachi, because... Uh, this this dovetails with uh, the Davidic psalm we just read. So in Malachi chapter 1, we, we see uh, God prophesying about future times, the messianic times. He says this, For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Look at this. God is promising in the future that from the rising of the sun to its going down, meaning for all days, his name will be great among the Gentiles. What that means is not that, you know, God's name is somehow etymologically great. It means that they're going to worship God and he's going to receive that worship. Gentiles are. These are people outside of the Israeli community, right? He says, in every place, in every place, which goes back to Abraham's promise that all families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham or through Abraham. In every place, meaning all nations, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. So this is God Almighty saying that a future time will come where the nations, all families of the earth, in fulfillment of the oath to Abraham, will be offering a pure sacrifice, a pure offering, which is important because if, if, the Messiah who's everlasting, right? You are a priest forever. If the Messiah who's to come will be a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, then that means that the Aaronic priesthood must have an expiration date. I said I, I spoke about that in the uh, back of the book when I read the back of my, my book, which means that there is a covenant to come with a new priesthood that will last forever. And if God is saying that in the future, that there all, all nations of the world, from the rising of the sun to its going down, for all days to come, that is, the Gentiles will be offering a pure offering. That must mean that the offering that the Gentiles are going to be offering in this coming era of the Messianic times will be an offering underneath the umbrella of Melchizedek's order. And what could that possibly mean other than taking out bread and wine like Melchizedek? And we're going to go into the significance of that as we get further into the course. Now, let's look at what St. Thomas Aquinas says here. He says in the Summa, this is... Uh, Third part, question 22, article 6, reply to object, second reply. He says, quote, Two things may be considered in Christ's priesthood, namely the offering made by Christ and our partaking of the offering. As to the actual offering, the priesthood of Christ was more distinctly foreshadowed by the priesthood of the law by reason of the shedding of blood. 
than by the priesthood of Melchizedek in which there was no bloodshedding. But if we consider the participation of this sacrifice and the effect thereof, wherein the excellence of Christ's priesthood over the priesthood of the law principally consists, then the former was more distinctly foreshadowed by the priesthood of Melchizedek, who offered bread and wine, signifying, as St. Augustine says, ecclesiastical unity, which is established by our own taking, by our taking part in the sacrifice of Christ. Wherefore, also, in the new law, that's the new covenant, the true sacrifice of Christ is presented to the faithful under the form of bread and wine, close quote. We'll flesh this more out in, in classes to come, uh, sessions to come. But the, without a doubt, Aquinas is understanding uh, that the new covenant sacrifice is Melchizedekian because it involves bread and wine, but it's also merged with Christ's new covenant offering, which is his body and his blood, and that it signifies our partaking of it because we eat the bread and we drink the wine that is Christ's body and blood. Now, I want to read a statement from um, a uh, Catholic theologian who was born in the 19th century, died at the beginning of the 20th century, um, because he he's going to give us some information that we need to know <clears throat> to give us further background about this, but also, as I had been saying, to show that this is not Eric's opinions, this is backed up by conciliar statements by the universal catechism of the church in the Roman catechism of the council of Trent uh, Aquinas speaks to this. We're going to see the theological um, pedigree here. I'm going to quote now the old Testament prophecies are recorded partly in types, partly in words following the precedent of many fathers of the church. See Bellarmine. De Eucharistia, the Council of Trent especially, Session 22, laid stress on the prophetical relation that undoubtedly exists between the offering of bread and wine by Melchizedek and the Last Supper of Jesus. The occurrence was briefly as follows. After Abraham, then still called Abram, with his armed men had rescued his nephew Lot from the four hostile kings who had fallen on him and robbed him, Melchizedek, king of Salem, Jerusalem, bringing forth bread and wine, for he was a priest of the Most High God, and he, Abraham, gave him the tithes of all. Catholic theologians, with very few exceptions, have from the beginning rightly emphasized the circumstance that Melchizedek brought out bread and wine, not merely to, prov to provide refreshment for Abram's followers, wearied after the battle, for they were all supplied with provisions out of the booty they had taken, but to present bread and wine as food offerings to Almighty God, not as a host, but as a priest of the Most High God. He brought forth bread and wine, blessed Abraham, and received his tithes from him. In fact, the very reason for his bringing forth bread and wine is expressly stated to have been his priesthood, for he was a priest. Hence, profere, which means to bring forth, must necessarily become offerere, even if it were true that the hephil word is not a hieratic sacrificial term, but even this is not quite certain. Accordingly, Melchizedek made a real food offering of bread and wine. Now, it is the express teaching of Scripture that Christ is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Christ, however, in no way resembled his priestly prototype in his bloody sacrifice on the cross, but only solely at his last supper. 
On that occasion, he likewise made an unbloody food offering, only that, as antitype, he accomplished something more than a mere oblation of bread and wine, namely the sacrifice of his body and blood under the mere forms of bread and wine. Otherwise, the shadows cast before by the good things to come would have been more perfect than the things themselves, and the antitype, at any rate, no richer in reality than the type. Since the Mass is nothing else than a continual repetition, commanded by Christ himself, of the sacrifice accomplished at the Last Supper, it follows that the sacrifice of the Mass partakes of the New Testament fulfillment of the prophecy of Melchizedek, close quote. I got that from his uh, encyclopedia, uh, his entry into the Catholic Encyclopedia in 1911, entitled The Sacrifice of the Mass. You could get it at New Advent if you want to read more. But what a beautiful synthesis of what we're saying here in Father Pole, who, by the way, is excellent. I find him a tremendous resource for many, many topics. Um, this isn't just recognized by Catholics. So the Darwall Stone, for those of you who don't know, was a Anglican. He was of the Church of England. He's more of like an Anglo-Catholic, really, when you read his theology. Um, but in his great two-volume work entitled A History of the Doctrine of the Holy Eucharist, Volume 2, he says the following, quote, The institution of the Eucharist, was the fulfillment by our Lord of the type of Melchizedek, who offered bread and wine and the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, as distinct from that of Aaron, is an abiding priesthood, the exercise of which remains in the Mass. The, priesthood, the priest after the order of Melchizedek abides forever in such a way that he sacrifices after the pattern of Melchizedek, and this takes place invis invisibly daily in the Mass when the church sacrifices his flesh and blood under the species of bread and wine. Close quote. That's going right back to Malachi, talking about the church who offers the pure offering, which has to merge with the Melchizedekian priesthood, because we know that according to the Messianic Psalm, that is going to be the everlasting covenant and the everlasting priesthood that the Gentiles will forever offer in the Messianic times. All right, I want to quote from another Catholic theologian. This one is the late Reverend Bernard Vincent Miller, writing in the, <clears throat> he, be, he was born in the 19th century, uh, writing in this frame of time, going into the 20th century. <clears throat> he says the following, quote, finally, something must be said of the argument to be drawn from Christ's priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. The argument, as repeated in dozens of theological textbooks, many be thus briefly set down. Priesthood and sacrifice are correlative. Are correlative. Priests of the same order must offer sacrifice according to the same rite. Melchizedek offered sacrifice in bread and wine. Therefore, so did Christ. But the only time he can possibly be said to have done this was at the Last Supper. And therefore, the Eucharist is a sacrifice. Intrinsically, and as a purely scriptural argument, this may seem to be defective. The Greek word translated order refers rather to rank, quality, manner, than to sacrificial rite. To this, no reference seems to be made either in the psalm or in the epistle, that is, to the Hebrews. In the latter, the writer is wholly occupied with the eternity and superiority of Christ's priesthood as compared with that of Aaron. This he illustrates and explains by saying that Christ is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The king of Salem is shown to be Abraham's superior by receiving from him the tributes of tenths, the tithes. 
He is the type of the eternity of Christ's priesthood by his manner of appearing in the pages of Scripture without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And therefore he is likened unto the Son of God and continueth a priest forever. Hence, those who are content with the purely objective and apparently obvious interpretation of Scripture may reject the argument, that is, the argument of the sacrificial aspect and connection between Melchizedek and Christ. Miller goes on to say, quote, but the Catholic Church has another criterion. For him, that is for the Catholic, the Church is the only authoritative interpreter of Holy Writ, and her voice speaks in the constant tradition of her fathers and doctors. Looked at in this light, the words under review appear as a convincing proof of the sacrificial character of the Last Supper. For, from the beginning of the second century onwards, hardly a Christian writer quotes them without seeing in them a reference to Christ's institution of the Eucharist and a demonstration of the sacrificial character of the Mass. As Petavius put it, on this point, the ancient writers agree to such an incredible extent that there can be no room for a legitimate doubt in the mind of any Christian. Close quote. This comes from his essay on the Eucharistic sacrifice in a two-volume work, originally edited by George Smith, entitled The Teaching of the Catholic Church, A Summary of Christian Doctrine. You can actually purchase this um, in new binding hardcover at a Roca Press. Um, I strongly recommend you get the, those two volumes uh, on Catholic theology. Now, Miller, uh, Miller here is doing something um, that I like to do, which is to um, test our theories. And Miller is saying, well, maybe the objective scripture isn't as clear on the... Uh, parallelism or the typological prefiguring of Christ's Eucharistic sacrifice in bread and wine being his own body and blood as some sort of parallel fulfillment of Melchizedek and his priesthood with bread and wine as his offering. Well, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't um, agree with Miller to the point where uh, the scripture doesn't have any persuasive value to offer on this and that we have to have, or like the only persuasive value is the, the tradition of the fathers and doctors and the tradition of the church. I would say the scripture itself has this persuasive value, and I'm going to expand upon that as we get further into the course. Let's go back to our slides. Okay. All right, so that's going to be it for the introduction. I told you I'd bring up the issue of... Uh, or the 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 the, uh, the book being available for, for purchase at the end of the of this presentation. So here, uh, if you see the screen, you can see uh, it's available on Amazon for Kindle for nine ninety nine. A hardcover is nineteen ninety nine. Paperback is twelve ninety nine. Uh, if you already own the book, if you've already read the book, if and enjoyed it, I would appreciate this if you left a review. It helps tremendously. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in this course, stick around because we've got uh, courses on each chapter of the book. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight. So there's going to be eight uh, lectures to this course. I look forward to it. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I think that if you, you if you're a Catholic, you want to be strengthened in your faith. Uh, you want to be able to resort to more than just John 6 and 1 Corinthians 11 and 12 when you're speaking to your Protestant friends and trying to uh, prove transubstantiation. This is definitely a course for you. Uh, if you're a Protestant, you're interested in why you must leave Protestantism according to the scripture itself. This is also a course for you. All right, so if you guys can share the news about this, uh, it would be helpful to me to grow my Patreon. Um, your, I want to thank those of you who have been supporting me 
thus far has been tremendously helpful to me. For those of you who don't know, I'm a father of six children, six boys. I'm raising to be godly men. And uh, my wife, I'm married, and she's uh, a beautiful woman, a uh, beautiful soul. And we are both we both appreciate um, the, the help and support you're giving us. It allows us to feed our family and to pay bills that we could not without your uh, donations and, and uh, your contributions. And uh, if you'd like to see me do more work and expand, please spread the word about this Patreon and uh, and, and let's see what the Lord does with our work in his vineyard. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time.